Once upon a time, in my mind's eye, lived these two paintings. Um, I'm not going to tell you too much about them because we will have future episodes that will be focusing on the whole concept behind the Pillsbury Doughboy and the lady in the orange dress and all that. But these paintings were kicking around in my head and, um, and a lot of times what I do is I'll maybe scribble down a concept, scribble down a, a composition. Sometimes when a painting is kicking around in my mind's eye, I will be remembering another painting that I had seen a while before. So when I was thinking of these ones, I was also at the same time remembering ah, this painting right here. Of course, I didn't know who did this painting and I didn't even have a copy of it. I just remembered it. Um, what I remembered liking and loving about it was the lead in to the, all the space here at the bottom and how the girls were sitting on the bench, which I kind of used as inspiration for this girl sitting on the bench here. I remembered how the, the skirts folded down and sat on the bench, which is what I was pretty much doing here with you know how I was gonna handle this particular composition. I remembered how sweet the girls looked like they were having this secret and having fun together talking. And I was, I'm always thinking about that kind of like the psychological, you know, inner workings of, of a particular painting. So I remembered those things about this painting, but I didn't actually, couldn't find the actual painting. I thought in my mind that it was by Norman Rockwell. Um, so I went looking through all my Norman Rockwell books, which, you know, from my book episode, I have like 10 of them. I could not find this painting anywhere. So I resigned myself to the, that it's just gonna be one of those things I don't know and maybe I will discover at some point. Until probably maybe eight years later, I saw, I went to the Max Ginsburg uh, retrospective show at the Butler Museum of, uh, or the Butler Institute of Art in Youngstown. And lo and behold, this painting was there. And so I was like, I was thrilled that I actually saw it and it was a big surprise. Um, and uh, I found out that he had painted this as an illustration actually for Bantam books. I'm assuming that there was a book and the reason that he left all that white space or all that um, empty space was because there were gonna be words there. Uh, but I thought it was a really nice compositional effect whether there's words or not. And it's in the collection of the New Britain Museum in Connecticut. So someday when travel is opened up again, I will be going there and I will check this painting out and hopefully it's on display. Um, so welcome to Living Figuratively. The, this is the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the fascinating faces and figures of people you don't even know? Why not fill your home with figurative art? Um, each week I will be spotlighting my own works or works from my collection. Uh, tonight's episode is Taking It to the Max, the Max Ginsburg episode. And you may be wondering why I'm dressed like this. Normally I dress like a lady, um, but I'm dressed like this as sort of a little bit of a tribute to Max Ginsburg, tennis shoes and everything, because this is what he wears all the time whenever I've ever seen him. In fact, in his book, right here, right on the very front page, there's a picture of him dressed exactly like that. Not only that, on the very back page, there's a picture of him dressed exactly like that, which I think is very cute. And uh, that's why I decided to you know, do, the, do the costume. But Max is a very, very humble guy. And I'm sure he doesn't want us to focus on his, you know, fashion sense and fashion tips. I'm sure he would rather have us focus on his art, which is exactly what we're going to do. And right now I'm going to introduce you to this beautiful piece of mine. It is in my collection. It's called Study of Carol, which I was thrilled to have be part of my collection. Uh, one of the things that I love about this, this is a sort of get a little more bang for your buck kind of a painting because there's an upside down painting under it. And the reason that I love that I love that is years ago, I went to see a show at the Met Breuer Museum in uh, New York. It was called Unfinished Business or Unfinished Something. 
And it was so educational because there were paintings by Caravaggio, Titian, Raphael, Velasquez, um, where they were unfinished paintings. And like paintings from the Renaissance and from great masters, if they weren't finished, it wasn't sort of a stylistic fun device that a lot of painters will do nowadays. It was because the client died, the artist died, the king was beheaded, the king had to be ridden out of town, town on a rail and the you know painting stopped. So there were, they, these paintings were intended to be finished, but they just weren't. So when you see an unfinished painting, you get to see all the tricks that the person, that the uh, artist used and just all the, you know, the process that they went through. And sometimes you get to see things that weren't that good and it kind of makes you feel like, hey, I can get through, muscle through the ugly stages of my own paintings. Um, Max, whatever he did under here, which, you know, is mostly covered up, but there's a little bit. He, it was not up to par for his standards. And, but he, instead of, you know, covering over the whole canvas, he just flipped it and started the new painting and brought together this beautiful, beautiful gem of a face here, which is what made me fall in love with this painting because the, you know, it just has this gorgeous, gorgeous face. And I love the pentimenti around it. Pentimenti is the um, artist word. It's an Italian word for, it actually literally means repentance, which basically is kind of interesting because, you know, you're repenting for doing a bad painting by doing a better painting on top of it and leaving evidence of the bad painting that you've done. So, you know, and I don't even think it was a very bad painting. I'm sure it was a really good painting and it probably would have been excellent, but it wasn't good enough for Max and so he flipped it. And I'm lucky enough to, you know, have this beautiful piece. Um, one, of the, one of the things though, Max Ginsburg, he does not always paint beauty. He's, you know, he's a beautiful painter, but he doesn't always paint beauty. He is actually a warrior for all kinds of social justice. And um, I'm going to show you in his book from his retrospective show, one of the most poignant pieces that he has in here. This one is called Piet the War Pieta. And Pieta, as many of you guys might know, um, it's the Italian word for um, the, the scene where the Virgin Mary is mourning for her dead son, Jesus. And Max has reinterpreted very, you know, it's all the American flag, the blood, the, you know, it, it's basically a very poignant statement against um, torture and war and, you know, all the horrible things that go on in the world. Uh, another thing that Max paints that I absolutely love, he's got this caretaker series where he notices caretakers of children and of elderly all over New York City and you know when I go to New York City I notice these too all the time you know these are like street scenes where there's people taking care of other people and um, but for him to notice them and paint them so poignantly and beautifully it's it really is just like recognizing a lot of unsung heroes which you know that I'm all about recognizing unsung heroes um, and then the other thing, since he is a consummate New Yorker, he's got all these beautiful New York street scenes where he notices the people selling the stuff at the corners. And whenever I go to New York, I see a Max Ginsburg on every single corner. So it's really, you know, it's just really, really very neat to, to see that and to see these, to see these scenes in real life and, um, and connect with them. This book is an awesome book. I bought it at the Butler uh, Museum shop years ago when he had his retrospective show there. But it's also available on Amazon. And if you ever take a workshop from him, he brings them to the workshop and you can buy them directly from him, which is even better because then you can go home with less in his suitcase. Um, I bought, you know, I, uh, and speaking of workshops, I took a workshop for Max last year at Susie Porges studio. It's called the art studio here in Cleveland. And it was, it was wonderful. It taking a, Ma, uh, a Max Ginsburg workshop. It's so inspiring. He's, you know, I think he might be 90 by now. I'm not positive at the time. I think he was 89 and um, it, I can't imagine how much energy 
he has at 89 because I get tired out from just participating in a workshop, let alone teaching it. And uh, it was really, you know, it was, it was a wonderful experience. The two paintings that I brought out here are ones that I did in the, um, in the workshop. And one of the beauties of taking a workshop with somebody that you really, really admire is that they will sometimes paint on your painting. Um, back in art school days when I was like 18, uh, I was really insulted if a paint, if a uh, teacher wanted to paint on your painting. I was, you know, I was like, don't do that, it's my artistic integrity. Now that I'm, you know, technically older and wiser, I, um, I love going to workshops with people that I admire and I'm very judicious about who I actually take workshops with. I don't just like, you know, oh, anybody, I'll, teach, I'll learn from anybody. I wanna be very careful with who I learn from. Um, so I can't tell you how much of this is like a little bit of Magical Max brush strokes on it that sort of made things sing or how much of it is, you know, me. I mean, I did work on them all day, but then sometimes when you're at a workshop, the instructor comes and sits down and does three magical things and boom, suddenly you're painting, you know, I keep using the word magic, but suddenly you're painting magically becomes something, something even better than you ever thought you could do. And this one right here is called Quiet on the Set, um, which it's actually a painting of um, two of my favorite models, uh, Tomika, who has posed for my Venus paintings, and then Robert Banks, who is a, um, a Cleveland filmmaker, who, and the, the painting is called Quiet on the Set because Max would always, when the chatter got a little too loud and people were just getting a little kind of sloppy and lazy, he would say, quiet on the set, you know, with his adorable New York accent. And I thought it was particularly appropriate because, you know, quiet on the set and it looks kind of like a movie set. So that was um, the, my paintings, you know, from the workshop, which, which was wonderful. Um, so now let's go to the, the main event that you guys have all been waiting for. Um, one of the other paintings that has stuck in my mind since the before time, when I very first saw it, um, is this one called Country Blues. And at the time that I saw it, I couldn't even tell you where it was, but I think it was at a museum or a major, a major gallery, probably sometime in the early 2000s. And when I saw this, it was during sort of the lean times of figurative art where it was a little pre-Facebook. And um, it was a time where, where whenever I went into a contemporary art gallery, if there was actually a realistic human image there, I was all over it like whatever, you know, flies on, flies on jam. Um, I just, I would just like totally gravitate to it and just soak it in and look at it and remember it, burn it into my memory because there were so few. And I didn't know that there were all these figurative artists working all across the world um, because, you know, many of the, the ones that you see in the museums are like, you know, the Rembrandts and the old guys that died 500 years ago. Uh, so when I saw this painting, it totally, totally burned into my memory. Now, of course, I'm not a label reader, so I didn't read the label. So I didn't really know who the artist was. And even if I had, I didn't remember who the artist was, but the image burned into my head. And I was like, you know, who, who is that artist? Who is that artist? When I went to the Butler to see Max Ginsburg's um, retrospective show back, you know, I want to say it was like 2015 or so, or 13. I saw this painting there and I was like, whoa, it just clicked into place because this one right here that had been burned into my, my memory and then this one that also had been just burned into my memory were both by the same artist. And I was like, all right, now I get it. Now I understand. So then, a couple years later, you know, since then, I followed him on Facebook. I, you know, I saw him win the Draper Grand Prize at the Portrait Society. He's actually about to win the, uh, or he, you know, already has, depending on how you, how you look at it, you know, with the Portrait Society happening. Um, he is about to win the gold medal, which is the most coveted award at the Portrait Society. And that's a self-portrait of him with the 
with the hat, same kind that, you know, I'm wearing right now. I'm not wearing the mask because my son is taping me and we're in each other's COVID bubbles. Um, but anyway, so I followed him and followed him. And one of the benefits of following an artist and paying attention to them and putting them on your see first thing in Facebook is that when they have a studio sale, you're right there, Johnny on the spot. And so when I saw that he was having a studio sale, I went and the, the study of Carol became mine very quickly. Um, and then I went clicking around a little bit more and I saw that Country Blues was also available miraculously. I mean, after 40 years. And, you know, sometimes that happens with, with figurative art. It sits and it waits for the right buyer. And I was like, I have to somehow work this out to make this mine. So um, my husband and I decided to get that for each other as our only Christmas gift to each other that year, 2018. And here it is in our living room. And I am totally thrilled that that it is now part, now it's part of my life. So um, when I was talking with Max about the painting, I wanted to get a little history and everything. And one of the things that he had told me about was that this was painted in 1978. And you can tell with some of the, the really cool 1970s touches, you know, we've got this fur, fur and leather coat over here. We've got this um, Budweiser, Budweiser can uh, the old kind where you took off the top and you threw it inside and you accidentally swallowed it and choked on it. Um, and, you know, the haircuts and the sideburns and the, the you know, uh, the way that, the way that people, people looked in the 1970s. So I love that, that vintage-ness of it. Um, I also love how it's painted. I love how you swoop into this space where they, they've created, Max has created this space for us to be in. And um, so, you know, that is just, just lovely. And I love the, you know, the hands and the character and the gestures of the different people, how he's incorporated this guy in the back, that, um, that he's part of the group and he's kind of leaning into it. Uh, it's, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful painting. Max told me all about it. Um, he said basically the way that it came to be Back in the from nineteen in the nineteen seventies, he was teaching at the New York School of Art and Design, and at the time, the arts classes that he was teaching, they really wanted him to teach more of a commercial uh, curriculum or non-objective painting. Nobody was teaching um, realistic painting back then, and he had some students that were really interested in doing that. So he started this morning group that, where the kids came to school from 6.30 to 8.30 in the morning before school, and they would paint each other. They would paint realistically, and Max would paint. They would paint with Max. They would pose for Max. They would all pose for each other, and it was sort of this, this workshop atmosphere. Um, some of the people who participated in this are some of our art stars today, Stephen Sale, uh, Ricky Muhika, both of them were part of this morning group at this high school back, you know, back in the day. And um, so he had high school students pose for this. He was, this is a painting that he was putting together inspired by old masters, inspired by Caravaggio and Rembrandt and, you know, some of those, those um, beautiful, dark but lit scenes of, uh, of real life. And um, so he had different students pose for different pieces, different ways, drew, put together sketches, and then he put them together into a composition and then had each one of the kids come back separately and pose so he could paint their portraits from life into this painting. So this painting was from life, even though it was composed in you know, a multifaceted kind of thing, um, but it was, it was the, the people were painted, painted from life. So that was, that was wonderful. That was wonderful about this. And, um, and now I'm thrilled that it's found its forever home in, in my home. Um, 
And I am thinking that that about sums it up for tonight. Thank you for joining me tonight for Living Figuratively. Next week, we're going to set a course for adventure atop the love desk. And get your mind out of the gutter. That's not what I'm talking about. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm not the type of gal that would clear off the desk, even for Captain Kirk or for Captain Steubing or even for my Prince Charming, no matter how many shoes he comes home with. No, the love desk, come tune in next week, you'll see what the love desk actually is. And, oh, now I was gonna do a New Yorky accent type thing and now I can't remember. Use, that's right, use. Use come back now next week at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Thursday night. And uh, you don't, don't even have to call first, don't be a stranger. <laughs>